spacious air, reflecting the way of life under the Florida sky. Even the lobbies funnel in the great outdoors. Chosen. I was set apart, set apart for God's use. Chosen. Chosen. I was set apart, set apart for God's use. All men is image. Chosen. They say the chain of shaitan is not that strong They say his time is running out, he ain't got that long They say murder, murder, kill, this is not that song Said I won't amount to nothing, they got that wrong Cause I was set apart and I was shown the light And if I get the kingdom, I'll be clothed in white One third will be delivered and the rest were blinded Their fate is set in stone, what you ain't read the fine print? What to do, family? What to do? What to do? This your brother Dan, represent Maccabees TV as always, and I am here this afternoon with a very special guest. Um, brother really doesn't need no introduction. If you listen to hip hop, if you know bars, then you know who this is. But for the one or two of you that's living under a rock, I got none other than a hip hop legend on here with me, my brother Cassidy. Cassidy. <laughs> My bad, man. You good? So, Brother Cass, without any further ado, man, the family's listening, man. Say peace to the family on Maccabees TV. Family, what's up with y'all? What's up with y'all, man? Thanks for having me, boy. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, bro. So, what we're going to do, we're going to get through these questions, Cass. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I mean, you've been on a million interviews. You've probably been asked the same question no less than a thousand times. So I'm just gonna put my own spin on it a little bit, man, and um, just ask you the questions I gotta ask you, man, and we just get it going. So, um, Split personality came out in 2003 or 2004? 2003. Came out 2003. Even better, man. You're talking about Eminem's Get Rich or Die Trying, Jay Z's Black Album, the Outkast Double Album. Big albums came out that year, and yet and still, you were able to find your own way. New artists. What do you attribute? So you having success in a year where you had so many other big albums that came out the same year? Um, I'm the GOAT, man. I really can rap, man. So it don't matter who I was dropping. I'm going to still have my core audience and my fan base that's going to support me. There's billions of people in the world. So, you know what I mean? It could be a lot going on. A lot of other people that got a good fan base and people that like them, but that's not going to take away from what you've done. So as long as you make music to the best of your ability, you're going to be lit. That's a fact. That's a 100% fact, for real. Um, the first record that I heard off that album, I don't know if it was your first record, but I believe it was the Hotel record. Now, I'm not going to ask you the question you think I'm going to ask you, but I am going to say to you that that wasn't a record that I expected you to come out with as your first single. So what I want to ask you, was that your decision to come out with Hotel as the first single, or was that more like a label's decision to kind of appeal you to radio more or less? Yeah, when you sign a um a record contract, man, you got a you got a whole team to work with, a lot of people that got input, you know what I'm saying? So um Hotel wasn't the type of record that I would have choose first neither. It wasn't the type of record that people was used to me doing before split personality, because I did have a fan base before that from DVDs, mixtapes, battle rap. You know what I mean? I had a fan base around the world and they knew me for getting busy and being aggressive. And then when you hear this hotel song, it's like, you know what I mean? Like a radio record for the ladies. It didn't fit what they was used to hearing from me. But I understood why the label that I was with wanted a record like that because those was the type of records that they was good at working. And I knew how impactful a record like that could be. So I understood why they wanted to go with it. But, um, I figured like we needed to paint more of a picture with the first project than just hotel and get no better. Cause it left the world. That was the world first time seeing me. Like, of course, certain people knew about me, but I mean the world first 
take of me was like that project. So they get two girl type songs like that. They might've thought I was a different type of rapper than what I was. And that's why I was so aggressive with forcing my next project after that, which came out in 05, the I'm a Hustler album. I was forcing that to be so much um, different. And the first single was I'm a Hustler. So it was a completely different approach from the first album. And I feel as though I needed to do that to let the world know what I was going to bring to the table. Word, word. And you know what because, about to see you. Go ahead, bro. Sorry. Because I was with that big machine like that, I knew it was going to be records that was coming out that was going to be um, like that. So that's why I called the, my first album Split Personality to let people know you're going to get records like Hotel, but I got a split personality. The next time you hear me, I might be in a different bag and expect that. Don't think it's weird because that's the type of rap I am. So I was trying to let people know ahead of time. It might have been a little hard to figure out, but it all makes sense now. Word, you know what I'm saying? And it's good that you said that because you have a lot of artists that start off underground. Like I use one that everybody knows, like Mace. He starts off underground and then he goes mainstream and he stays mainstream. And then when he tries to go back underground a couple of albums later, the people don't accept that from him no more. So it was good that by your second album, you actually went back to the streets because that's what we knew you for. And that's what we respected you for. That's where your that's your bread and butter at the end of the day. And listen, to me, I'm a hustler was just as big a hit as Hotel. And the remix with Mary, that was fire. Yeah, that was and, I, and I never really left the streets because that whole time I was still um, battle rapping and on um, mixtapes and DVDs. And I still had hard records on the Split Personality album. It's just that the records that was getting pushed and the money behind them was the more commercial records. So people that might not have been really into me and dug deep in all they know is what play on the radio, then them people might have thought I was just a hotel type of rapper. But it was a large amount of people in the world that did listen to my whole first project and more of the things that I was bringing to the table at that time and knew that I wasn't like a bubblegum rapper. Word. And you know what? I want to talk a little bit about your work ethic because from the beginning, from I've been following you, which is really from the beginning, I'm talking about when you was on those Rough Rider records, all the way till today, the one consistent thing with you is that you're a hard worker, which is rare. You know, I'm talking about most people will put out their album and then you don't really hear from them other than touring and going on radio, but you put out your records and you put out independent stuff as well as when your records are out, like you're really hard working. So what I'm asking you is, were there, who was like in, an influence to you as far as like when you were coming up and listening to rap, was there any particular rappers that kind of influenced you as far as putting words together, having like, immaculate lyrics, the way the words batch together, as far as having work ethic. It doesn't necessarily have to be somebody that's well known. It could be somebody that was from your block or from your city, whatever. Like who kind of influenced you to go in that direction? <clears throat> um, So many people, like, you know what I mean? I was like born in the hip hop. My mom and my dad used to rap before I was born. So I was born in the hip hop. Sure, they gave me some inspiration. Um. But everybody that I listen to, I try to take something out of what they do, like to, to figure out the add to the science, to understand why people might like them or what they bring to the table, because I really try to study the science. So I did a record recently called The Four Elements, where I shouted out a lot of rappers that played a part in me becoming who I am. But there's so many that I, I couldn't even name them all on this show, and I know I'll be leaving some out because they all played a part to me somehow, some way. But um, even dudes like um, Kyle Akbar, Shiz Lansky, the dudes that was in Larceny family in the group with me, they was like a little older than me. So they already was rapping and doing their thing when I was younger. So them dudes inspired me to get on my job and I learned things from them. Um, all different type of people that I've been around, man. Um, my, one of my first managers was William Hart, the lead singer of the Delphonics. So that's like one of the biggest groups of all time. And he put out a lot of hits. So. He was an inspiration, taught me a lot about the business. When I was young, before I started rapping, I got a chance to go on tour with the stylistics. So um, they was inspirations. It's like I just got inspired for so many different reasons and by so many different people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's real shit. I got a question for you, and I know you can only answer this politically. You can't really answer this directly because of contractual obligations. But it's something I always wanted to ask you as far as your writing skill is concerned. Have I ever heard, I'm talking about not something underground that I never heard, but have I ever heard a record on the radio 
by a mainstream artist, whether it be a rap or anybody that Cassidy wrote that I wouldn't know that you wrote. It's just a yes or no. You ain't got to tell me who. Have I ever heard something mainstream that you wrote that you wish you could tell us, but you can't tell us? Of course. Definitely. All right. And do you find that writing stuff like that, do you enjoy ghostwriting? That's what I want to know. Or do you prefer to have your face and your name associated with what you wrote that came from your heart? I might enjoy both. You know what I mean? Um, with ghostwriting, you can do things that you can't do when you're writing for yourself. You can tell different stories, talk about different things. Even when I'm writing for females, I'm coming from a female perspective, which I never come from if I'm writing for myself. Mm. So it's just a lot of bags that you could jump in when you ghostwriting that you can't when you're writing for yourself. So I like them both. They, it's different. And of course, I just want to write for myself more than anybody else because I want to be the best. I ain't start rapping to say that I wanted to make somebody else the best. I wanted to rap for me to be the best. But I guess writing for people and giving people the blueprint is a part of being the best. So I like doing that too. Hell yeah, some of the greatest songwriters in all genres, man, wrote for other people and made them great. And they wrote great stuff for themselves too. So I agree with you 100%. Real quick before I move on to another subject as far as the main in mainstream industry is concerned, last question. Um, music nowadays, because I'm in kind of in the same age bracket as you, maybe slightly older. And hip hop for me nowadays is difficult outside of battle rap and like underground stuff like what you've been doing recently. It's kind of difficult, man. Um, how you feeling about the music that's being you know pushed right now by the mainstream industry? Because to me, it's, it should have its own category. Like it's almost not hip hop because what you do putting so much into your writing and then to hear some of these dudes on the radio where they're practically not saying nothing is, is difficult. Maybe it's just because I'm a little older, like I said, but um. What do you think? Um, um, it's the same as it always been. Back in the day when hip hop first started, it was dudes that wasn't too advanced with the science at that time, it wasn't too good, but they still was doing music and it was around. But at the time, the business was pushing a little bit of dudes that was Cooper. So it seemed like those was just the only people doing it but it's always been like that it's been dudes that's been lyrical and not lyrical all during the time that hip-hop been around so it ain't changed it's not like there's more weak weaker niggas now than it used to be it's the same amount maybe more niggas trying to get in the industry because the business made it seem like it's easier to do like if you hear a song with less complicated lyrics and you feel like you could have wrote it, you might feel like, damn, I could be a rapper, I could get on. So it's more people trying to rap, but the same amount of people that would have been garbage back then is the same amount of people that would be garbage now and can't put lyrics together. But it is a lot of dope creative dudes, you know, just like it was back in the day. So all of the new dudes don't fall in the same category and you can't categorize every young rapper because they all don't do the same thing they all don't follow the same science so i don't categorize them all the same it just depends on who you're talking about but right. uh, nowadays a lot of new artists don't got artist development no more so they mm. just um falling in love with hip-hop because it's so dope and they just love it and they just become a part of it and just start doing whatever comes naturally they don't really got no um especially if they family or somebody close to them wasn't already in the business to give them some type of blueprint of guidance, they freely just do it and they make mistakes. And nowadays, there's no artist development because it ain't that much money coming into the label. So they're not willing to sacrifice as much money as they used to. So artists back in the day might've been making some of the same mistakes as artists now, but they had artist development. So they might sign, but you might not hear them until four or five years later when they already learned a lot and went through making songs and making the mistakes that the artists make now, but you never heard it and they don't come out until they get it together. And that was even before our time, like even the biggest groups in the world, like the Temptations went through a lot of changes and members and would sign the Motown for years and years and years making music and never got a chance to pop until years later. You know what I'm saying? So that was a, a lot of artist development that they had to go through be before they became the group, the temptations that everybody remember. So 
a lot of these new artists don't get the opportunity and that's why we're not hearing the best music possible. But that's why it's dudes like me that know the science back teaching it so that these new dudes can learn more and bring better music to the table. Mm, okay. I kind of want to switch gears a little bit about something you were doing recently, man. You were putting a lot of bars out during this quarantine, man. You was putting some real fire material out. It was great. So I want to compliment you Thank on that. But I don't necessarily want to ask you about that. This is what I want to ask you. And there's no right or wrong answer. So I'm going to give you mine first, right? With you rapping about the coronavirus and putting those lyrics together, there's two schools of thought on it. One school of thought is it's real and the numbers are inflated. Another school of thought that it's not real at all. Um, I know that you're a real intelligent dude and you don't just rap about R&B. You don't just rap about the street, but you actually have knowledge as well. So I kind of want to get your take as much as you want to tell me. What do you think about this current pandemic that's going on? Because you definitely put a lot of bars out about it. Um, <clears throat> I believe the pandemic is real and fake at the same time. Like, see, when people try to say it's real, they try to make everything about it real. And then when they say it's fake, they try to make everything about it fake. And I don't agree with neither one of those things. I believe that there's a such thing as the COVID-19 virus and Corona. Like, even if you look on lights or cans or like certain cleaning products that say that it kills COVID on the can. And, and, and this, these things were written on these cans before we had this pandemic. So they've been new about COVID. We've been new about the coronavirus. It been existed. So it's not just like something made up or that came out of nowhere. But I do believe um, the fear that's put on the people from the coronavirus and the danger that the general population is in was um, magnified. So I think people living in fear and they more afraid than they need to be. You know what I'm saying? Even though it is real, just like the common cold is real. Everybody know that. Everybody know the flu is real. Everybody know pneumonia is real. That's things people been catching before me or you was born, before our parents was born, before our grandparents was born, people was catching those things. So it been around, it's not a mystery, but People not scared to death. They're not scared to come outside your whole life. You was never scared to go out and play with your friends or go play basketball or go on a, nothing because that stuff was around. Over 40, well, I think like uh, um, 40 million people probably died from AIDS. You know what I'm saying? But ain't nobody still staying in the house. Ain't nobody quarantining. Ain't nobody wearing plastic body suits or nothing like that. You know what I'm saying? So... I'm not saying it ain't real, but the fear that's placed on the on the public and the things that they making people do because it's around, I think is for different reasons other than to keep people safe. Well, definitely, that's definitely that's a good answer. I'm, we're in line and we're in tune on that as well, and um, that's why I wanted to ask you that because I know, like I said, that there's another side to you that sometimes when you do interviews, people don't ask you some of these things. So I wanted to make sure I asked you some things besides the normal run of the mill questions. The next thing, too, I saw a freestyle from you a couple of years ago. I think you did it on The Breakfast Club. I don't remember which. It was The Breakfast Club or it was Sway. It was one of the two. And that was a side of you, too, that a lot of people weren't used to seeing, but I know it's there. And you were speaking about the most high. You were speaking about God. You were rapping about that. And I remember after you rapped about that, Charlamagne then was so blown away by it. And a lot of people don't know that there's that side of you. So... I guess what I want to ask you is kind of a two-part question. I want to ask you, do you consider yourself to be a spiritual person? Not so much religious, but do you consider yourself to be a spiritual person? Do you consider yourself to believe in the most high? And I definitely know that you've rapped about it on some of your projects as well. So, you know, if you want to elaborate a little bit on that as well. I feel anything that's created has to be a creator. So it's definitely a higher power. Um all the information about the higher power we wasn't given. So we got to figure it out. So as people live, they document, they write, they learn, they try to figure it out and they get passed down through generation, through generation and through generation. And that's how we try to figure out how the higher power work. But it's definitely a higher power. There's no way that everything would be able to function how it's functioning so properly if it wasn't nobody keeping it in control, if it wasn't the power controlling it. So um, definitely I believe in the higher power. I'm not religious though. I believe that's 
um, religion was made to control the people and use the spirit, spirituality that naturally in people to manipulate them and do whatever you want them to do. So I'm not religious, but I definitely believe in a higher power. I know it's a higher power for sure. Um, I have one more question on this wave, and then I'll switch to something else real quick. And I'm an Israelite. I'm a Hebrew, right? And I remember a few years ago, you actually used the name that we Israelites use as you said, Yahweh. And you had the community in a frenzy in a good way. Like, I'm, I know you know. People were really talking about that, sharing that. They were going crazy on that. So I want your honest assessment, bro. And I ain't going to take it no way. What is your assessment? Because you're from Philly. They heavy down there. What do you think about the Israelite community as far as what you know? Whether it be a little or a lot, what do you think about the Israelite community? And, you know, think, go ahead. That's it. Um, I love the Israelite community, man. Um, I believe they dope. Got a lot of dope insight, a lot of things that people that's not Israelites can learn from the Israelites. Um, they try to do a lot of study and a lot of research and not just with what's thrown in front of them. They try to go back as far as possible and try to do as much research as possible. And that's what humans are supposed to do. So um, I fuck with the Israelites heaven for sure. And yeah, sure. With the scripture that's written, like most of these modern day religions that use to control people, with all of the books that they use, you know, these books been translated and interpreted and rewritten so many times. But if you go back to the original way these scriptures was written, like at the Old Testament, and you look at the original way that the, the scripture was written, um, they wasn't calling the higher power the things they calling them now. You know what I'm saying? He had a name. You know what I'm saying? And the name that they used was Yahweh. And the name that they used for the son of God was Yahweh Shah. So if you look in the real original scriptures, then that's what you will find. But um, um, yeah, I mean, people just got to do their research, man. And then the people that do do their research got to continue to spread information and document it so that the next generation and the next generation and future generations could just be in a better predicament. Because when me and you was born, we was born off the off the strength of the information of the people that came before us. When you was born, cars already was invented. Phones was already invented. Electricity. Everything was already here. You didn't just come like the original first man that was born with no information. You had a lot of information just off the strength of all of the people that came before you. So your parents that raised you had a bunch of information off the strength of the ancestors. So if we keep learning, keep growing, keep connecting and keep passing down the information, the better the next generation and the generation after that, and the better that we'll just keep continuing to be. No doubt. I appreciate that. And let me just tell you, the community is going to love you again for saying that. They loved you last time. They're going to love you again for saying that. But I'm going to go ahead and switch the topic. I, I know your time is limited. I ain't going to hold you down. I want to talk a little bit about battle rap, but again, I'm not going to do it the way that everybody else does it. I'm going to try to keep it a little bit different. So let me tell you, first of all, when you came back with disaster, that was all good, whatever, whatever. It was good you came back. You got the bag. That was beautiful, right? But the energy you brought back to battle rap when you was dealing with goods, before y'all even battled, dudes was no showing. Dudes was coming to battles, choking, stumbling, doing interviews. Just It was just it was just crazy, man, doing face-offs where they both, both opponents are saying they don't want to be there. It was just complete buffoonery. And even before you battled goods, just the energy you brought back, you had all the bloggers going crazy. You had the fans going crazy. Dudes is doing numbers they never did on their damn uh, blog, blog shows and the whole nine. And I'm not saying that just because you're sitting there. It's real shit, right? So I'm good friends with um, Harriet Tubman. She's um, John John's in and for his uh, Battle League bullpen, right? So they were having an event the next day after your event. But... I was invited, but I really went down there because you was battling. I was in the building. And I want to say, man, that the energy you brought back was, was excellent, bro. But what I want to ask you is, why do you think it is? And even since you've been on there, it, it went right back to the same thing with dudes is choking and they don't give a shit. Dudes don't. It's the same shit, bro. I want to know, man, um, what's your message to the up and coming battlers that are in that are up and coming that you could give a man so that they could bring that same energy and excitement to the culture that you brought because it only comes out every time you come out, bro. Outside of that, a lot of a lot of the battle rappers is um doing the same thing that a lot of the industry rappers is doing and just looking for an easy way out. 
an easy way to get success, an easy way to get a bit, an easy way to get a bag, but don't want to put a lot of work in. And that's why you're seeing them not perform to the best of they the best of their capabilities or the way that you would want to see them perform because they're not working hard enough. You know what I mean? And when they battle rapping, most battle raps, well, nowadays they only one round with these quarantine battles and stuff. But the most of the B is a three round battle. So that's only three raps you got to write. And most of these dudes don't even battle that much. Like, so if you battle every three months or something like that, so you got a month the right one verse. That's not a lot. That's like, that's not shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? And there's people working at McDonald's making minimum wage that's working eight hours a day. So how can you compare in a month time writing one verse to a person working eight hours a day? But you want to be successful, rich, get all of the girls, all of the money, travel the world and be a millionaire. But this person's supposed to make minimum wage. And I think that's the reason why we're not getting the type of music or the type of battles that we want, because these dudes don't necessarily be prepared and they don't work hard enough. And that's what I'm back to encourage. Like, get on your job. Like, if you want to be the best, you got to work at it. You got to grind to do it. And any other profession you see niggas working in basketball, LeBron James is, or Steph Curry or Kevin Durant or any of these dudes that's considered to be the best they super work hard. Like, you know what I'm saying? You got to stay in crazy shape. You got to shoot thousands of shots. You got to be super working. And this, why they in the NBA, not to mention college, high school, middle school, all the other little leagues that they played in to get there. But these dudes want to write a couple raps and get lit. Like, you know what I'm saying? And that's why we having problems because, and there's nobody around that's enforcing them to work harder. Everybody is big enough. They lack of work. So when they do choke or when they do not perform, people was accepting that and saying, oh, that was a good battle. Or, Yo, that's the culture. So people is supporting they lack of effort. And that's the reason why they they not trying to show more. They not trying to step it up. And But when I came back around, I created that type of energy and that type of temperature to force niggas to have to step it up. But you're not going to get no light at all. So they, they felt like they had to step it up when I was around. But now that I'm gone, all that pressure is off them, so now they starting to light up again and choke and fuck up, not show up. Bunch of dumb shit going on, and there's nobody to oversee it, nobody to put these niggas in check, nobody to call them. Yo, you ready? You battle in two more weeks. How many verses you got? What you doing? But you're like, there's nobody to do that. They just, everybody just accept it, man. And that's why the shit is like how it is. But that's why I feel like I need to be back, not just in music, but battle rap too. And inspire these dudes to go in the right direction and then show them that hard work do pay off. I ain't just saying work harder just to stress yourself. Now, when you work harder, it's going to pay off. You're going to see the results, not just in the battle, but everything revolved around battle rap. Yo, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you something real quick. I don't know how much more time I got with you, but I was in the building, right? And I'm going to tell you something. The area that I was in, everybody was going for you and rooting for you. And it's so funny because Closer to the stage, I was a little further back. Closer to the stage, obviously, you had a lot of battle rappers down there, and they was heckling and doing what they was doing. But, bro, it's funny because the comment board spoke volumes. Because as soon as the battle came out, everything that the bloggers were saying and everything else, the comment boards were saying different. Why do you think that that is? Why do you, why do you, what, what do you attribute that to, that people didn't fall for that narrative that was being pushed by everybody? Is it because they consider you an outsider? Or, like, what do, what do you think that is? Um... Well, yeah, for sure. Not, But not just an outsider. I was an outsider putting pressure on all of the insiders. Like I, I came from the outside and I was putting pressure on everybody, not just one person, but everybody felt under pressure. So they all ganged up together to be against me. And that's what I wanted. The, the people that was in the stadium or people in battle rap might not have understood what I was trying to do. It's not going to make sense all at first. But it's all coming together now. Like, everybody going to see what I'm trying to do. And I got a plan. Like, these dudes don't know what they're doing, man. They don't know which direction to go in. So I got a plan. And it's not going to, um, if you used to, 
dudes doing something for years and years and years and you was a big fan you was big enough battle rap you were saying that it's better than industry rap these is the best dudes in the world you was the one representing it and then i come back and i say man these niggas is trash they fucking up it's going to make you the person that was backing it and supporting it look like i'm talking about you too so most of the people that be in the crowd be those type of people. They be battle rap supporters that love battle rap. They fans of battle rappers. They think this is the best form of rap. But when you criticize it and then you talking bad about it and you're not really giving them the props that they used to getting, then people don't, they don't like that. Like, you know what I'm saying? But with battle rap, it's, it, you there to see who the best rapper, man. You're not there to to play no games. You're not there to impress no one person in the crowd because there's billions of people in the world. So even if it was 100,000 people in the crowd and they all thought you lost, it still could be billions of more people in the world that feel like you won. Like, you know what I'm saying? And everybody don't agree on the same thing. So like, for instance, you said you were Israelite. If you go in there talking your knowledge around a, a bunch of people that's atheists and you got 100,000 atheists in the crowd, they might not be clapping and cheering like you talking the truth. They might be like, boo, fuck out of here. They might, it might, it might, you never know what happened. You know what I'm saying? What, what type of vibe they'll be on when they hear that information, even though you might be speaking the truth and you might not be violating them at all. All you speaking is the truth, but they don't take it like that. But if it went out to the world on the internet, Maybe all the atheists are joining with that crowd, but all of the people that feel like you are joining with you. Like, yo, this man was speaking the truth. I don't give a fuck how much they boo. You ain't hear what he said? He said this, this, and this. That's the fucking truth. Like, you know what I'm saying? So who, what are you going to do? Are you going to get in front of them atheists and change your whole way of thinking and just talk like the atheists just because they around? Or are you going to stick to what you believe in and still talk the same even though you're in the room full of atheists? Yo, bro, that's the best explanation i mean you said it many times in different ways that's the best explanation i ever heard you get maybe it's because you said this use the israelite analogy i don't know bro but that was fire <laughs> bars that was bars cast that's what it do listen real quick man i ain't gonna hold you too much longer um i want to know what you got going on or coming up like i did see that you you make beats now you know i think i think your man 40 cow was hating on that but i ain't gonna even bring that up right now i'm sure you get asked that a million times so don't leave that alone but um i see you made beats now you're doing them just for yourself or you know, you got somebody, you know, maybe something coming out of a big project. I just released the record, it's on all platforms. It's called Go Left, is a 40 cow diss, and I made the beat to it. It's, it's produced by me, and I wrote 100% of it. It's on all platforms. It's called Go Left, it's streaming crazy right now. So, you know what I mean? Tell them to make fun of that. <laughs> yeah, 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 especially. I haven't heard them come back from that yet, but um, you producing for anybody that we know, you ain't, ain't got to give a name, or you just, really just for yourself right now, your people. Yeah, um, I really just started taking um it serious about like eight months ago. So um I ain't been producing that long. So I've been really just trying to get my sound together, get my vibe together. So I've been jumping on a lot of my beats and I've been producing for artists that's down with my team, they hand music. Like I got a lot of artists that I'm working with, so I've been producing with them because they write in-house, so they able to hear the beats when I'm making them say which ones they like and pick them so not to give them right to them but i'm not like at the producer level to where like and i don't think i'm ever going to be to where i'm like making files and emailing beats off or like you know what i'm saying i'm not going to be that type of producer i'm gonna just um like do customized production for myself or for other people you know what i'm saying because i got so much other stuff going on and i'm mainly rap you know what i'm saying so if I was a if I had as much time to dedicate to production like as I dedicate the rap, then it would be different. But um I'm splitting my time up. But my son, he's 16 years old, his main cast go crazy. And he don't rap or do none of that other stuff I do. All he do is produce constantly all day. Mm -hmm. I got by the time he like 17, about to turn 18, he's gonna be the best producer in the world. There so you, there you, you know. Look out for him. He coming, he coming around real soon. Cash go crazy. He got a lot of uh production that he doing for, but you know, he got the younger, the younger kids that he producing for that's like putting up a lot of numbers and streaming a lot, and he doing a lot, man. Um, he's selling beats every day, he's making bags, his cash app blowing up. So I'm I'm excited, I'm proud of him. 
Uh, all right, no doubt. Um, listen, last thing before I let you go, King. Um, is there anything that you're doing outside of the music that you think people should know about? Like, I don't know, writing books, writing a movie, writing a movie script, like anything else going on that you might have coming that you want the people to know about? Um, yeah, I just wrote my first movie. Um, I knew I would probably be a good writer, but I just wrote my first movie. So I'm looking to shoot by the end of the year, the beginning of the next year. So I'm excited about that. Um, I'm excited about doing some more acting real soon. Um, I'm coming with a book next year. Uh, um, my video dropping on the 29th and my single is called Lean On Me. It's going to be on all platforms on the 29th and the video dropping. It's going to be a world star hip hop exclusive. Um, I just dropped another video yesterday with a, um, a rapper named K Walker. He's from Philadelphia. He battled rap and he make music. But I just jumped on the remix with him and we released the video um, yesterday. It's called Freak On. It's crazy. And um, I'm just working. I got a project called The Energy coming real soon, any day now. Um, I got so much going on. Everybody tuned in. Go to the web page too, www.cassidythehustler.com. We got all of the merchandise the t-shirts, the hoodies, the hats, snapbacks, corona masks, sweatsuits, we got it all, man. So let me ask you this last question, King, real quick. If the if somebody came to the table, I know it depends on what, what the money is on the contract, but if somebody came to the table right now with a contract for you and you had to choose, based on what you're doing, would you prefer to stay independent? Because you're going hard independent, or for is sure. there a possibility that you would go back to being on a major label? Yeah. Um. It was my decision to become independent. It's not like they forced me to be independent or I got dropped or something. Like once I learned enough of the business, I always wanted to be independent. So I've been independent for the last 15 years and never been trying to like change my situation or, or like get a record deal or nothing like that. Like I'm comfortable with being independent. And I was blessed to become a household name and get such of a core audience before I went independent that it's a little easier for me than for a normal independent person. So I was able to take advantage of that and be able to do what I need to do. So um, I'm not against doing business with nobody. Just the business I do just got to make sense. Like I'm willing to do business with anybody that got a good business proposal if it makes sense. But I'm not willing to just become a slave or get robbed to set myself in the, up in a situation that I know don't make sense for me or my creativity. So when I'm independent, I got more creative control. When I'm in this interview, I don't got no publicists or nobody telling me how I can answer the question, what I could say. You ask me about um, the coronavirus or you ask me about the Israelites, I can answer however I want because I don't got nobody to answer to. I don't got no boss that's going to tell me to say what I need to say. I could do quarantine freestyles about whatever I want to talk about. I could release this song, Lean On Me, that I'm about to release on the 29th. That's like a groundbreaking record. I could do joints like that because that's what I feel and what I want to do. I don't need nobody to tell me, oh, you need a record like this or we need to get on like this. Or It's just like I could just really be creative and do it from the muscle. And that's what I love more than anything. So I don't think I want to sacrifice that for what comes along with signing with majors. Yo, bro, I appreciate you. Um, for those that don't know, you could drop your hats, tell them where they can find you at, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, the social media, Cassidy underscore Larceny. And for business, get with me at shitliddy at Gmail. No doubt, no doubt. Well, family, I had a legend on, on here, man, and I definitely appreciate him taking time out of his schedule to come and holler at us. And hopefully, man, you know, you had a good vibe on the channel, and maybe I could ask you back one day, hopefully. You know what I'm saying? But I definitely appreciate the interview, King. Nah, I fuck with the vibes, man. Hit us up whenever you're ready to do it again. I'm going to keep working, so we're going to have some more shit to talk about, man. You got it, man. You got it. No doubt, King. Peace out. Blessings to you, King. Easy.